Hi there. This is a list of the top seven most notable news moments of 2022 for A Song of Ice and Fire, House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones fandom, books and TV series overall, and most notable, positive or negative, just the most prominent things. I wasn't originally planning on making this, but Red Team Review private messaged me. Carmine said, hey, me and Preston Jacobs are working on a more in-depth, deep dive on the top news of 2022. Can you think of a list? And I said, well, sure. And I go back to my YouTube studio, went through everything I reported on in 2022, and I put a great deal of thought into what were the top news moments. And I said, I might as well share it with you guys, dashing it off as an audio-only thing. So this is audio-only, and I'm not editing it. That I didn't work on the presentation of this, but thought went into what were the top news moments. I'm just not, I'm not taking time to, you know, make slides and stuff. And I didn't plan on making a top 10 list, but when I sat down and looked at everything from January through right before episode one came out of House of the Dragon, it turned out to be 10 things. So I said, okay, I'll make a top 10 list for preseason and a top 10 list for season one. But then I condensed it into one big top seven list, because season one is really one thing. Th that I could list ten things from season one, but there wasn't a big controversy on the scale of uh, the Sansa rape controversy in season five, or some other really stupid thing like Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. There was nothing on that scale. There wasn't something truly as shocking as the Red Wedding or something in terms of positive things either, so everything was tied to the impact of WOW! Premiere night, the first episode, it was really good, just really well put together. That counts as one thing. So in the final list, it's... as a catch-all for season one is Premiere night, the first episode, the impact of that, and then six other things. I took the top ten preseason things and said this is really six things to make a top seven list, because seven is a good number. So, going through this, and I'm not going to edit it, but how, how far am I in this? Three minutes? Okay. Chronologically, last January, point one of ten, what we were talking about through all of January was that filming got delayed due to the COVID spike, Omicron variant. We later found out filming was supposed to wrap in December, and instead they finished second week of February. They got delayed two months. I like how one of the directors said, we were two weeks away from finishing when the first person got Omicron. We shut down for a few days, come back, someone else would get Omicron, we had to shut down again. So for two months we were perpetually only two weeks away from finishing. And if you remember what was dominating the news in January, it's us being frustrated that filming wasn't done, that it was this limbo state where filming was on pause, we weren't getting spy photos anymore because they were interior scenes, and HBO quite well explained reasonably, we can't give a release date when we don't know when they're going to finish filming, because it could keep getting delayed through March for all we know. That And they explained pretty well, once the live filming with actors wraps, we have a better idea of when it can come out, because post-production is people working on computers. You can do that inside. You don't need to worry about COVID spikes. So the first big thing was the COVID delay. That officially pushed season one from its intended summer release two months to an early fall release. They weren't planning on that. And inadvertently, that put them head-to-head -head with Lord of the Rings and all those other comparisons, but... That's what was really dominating the news then, was the production delay. Point two would take a while to explain. That happened in February, I'll get back to that. But going chronologically, point three was a George R. R. Martin blog post. This wasn't one of the big things that made the cut to the top seven, but February 20th, Martin revealed through his blog, here's the full writing staff for season one of House of the Dragon, and here I am taking a group photo with them. It's nothing huge. I mean, we eventually found it out from watching the season, but just, dear God, this show has a full, quote, writing staff and not two novelists with no prior television experience and no oversight. 
that just all the problems that led to Game of Thrones decline. I keep thinking of the Austin Film Fest panel, the last really public thing Benioff and Weiss did in um, in October of uh, 2019, and the backlash to that, that major things like Esquire and Forbes were yelling at them that they're frauds who fake their way into this, they're not real writers, that they were boasting at it, HBO was pressuring us to hire career writers, and we refused because it's ours, and they would outshine us. And, like, don't say that at a writer's conference. And like, N.K. Jemison, and Hugo winning writer N.K. Jemison, really laid into them about that over Twitter. I've quoted her a lot about it. Of just, why didn't we get the best qualified and dedicated people? We'll never know what it could have been had we had that, and that should haunt you. I kept that quote and I put it in my videos a lot, but I'm thinking like today with like The Witcher, that the writers on it just plain don't like the source material to the point that Henry Cavill left the show recently. And even then, like the head of The Witcher is a, whether you like her or not, she on a resume has been a career writer for 20 years in television. In, the, in contrast, in this, it's you, and then look at what happened with Lord of the Rings, where they were relatively, well, they were script doctors, but they never produced a television show before, and even they weren't this bad as Benioff and Weiss, who had zero prior experience and who really didn't respect the source material. Why don't we get the best? And this is a frequent thing these days, like uh, Star Wars franchise and, and other things of who the hell do you hire as writers? Because this is the most important part, more than anything else, and it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. You need qualified writers. So it was nice to see him posting, oh, look, here's the full writing staff. And incidentally, that oh, look, half of them are women, half of them are people of color. Or that, that was another thing from Austin Film Fest. It was someone stood up during the Q&A and asked, why didn't you hire other writers who were like women or people of color? And they did not have a response. And again, my big thing is this isn't about diverse. It's a symptom of the bigger problem of cronyism. That when you're only hiring your, your friends or promoting up your, your assistant, you're not going to have a diverse staff. But that's a symptom of the bigger problem if you didn't hire writers, period. And, and, and that it, it shows like that, that Martin posting, oh, look, here's the full writing staff, that people did not feel confident in this show at all. And that, wow, look, no, we hired real writers, and there's a full writer's room this time. Uh, we were talking about that a lot February to March, and this didn't make the cut to my top seven things, but it was one of the top ten preseason things going month by month of, wow, the, the, let's examine who these writers are. And I'm, again, I'm linking the Martin blog posts in the description box below if you want to refer to the bigger ones, because the next one is one of the bigger ones. The March 9th blog post that Martin made, it was a huge update. You know, sometimes he has a poster, it's like, hey, here's the writers, or here's a football game I watched, or here's a trip I took. But then he has, like, really important, really long and thorough blog posts where he talks about project development on a scale of years. But, like, two years later, we'll refer back to a really important blog post. This is one of them. And it's linked below the March 9th blog post where he gave official confirmation on all of the current spin-off projects and, and also confirmed who the writers were for each of them. That this had all leaked a year before in spring of 2021. We didn't hear a peep out of Martin about it. That this was the first time he not only acknowledged that yes, those other spin-off leaks are real, but he gave a very thorough description of each of them. That he said the three live-action things in contention are Nymeria, Voyages of Young Corliss, Duncan Egg, and a couple of animated projects, including a Yee-T one. He, can, he, for the first time, uh, this wasn't just confirmation, this was news, he said, these are the writers attached to each of them. Also news, not just confirmation, was he said that they've all advanced from the pitch phase to the we ordered a pilot script phase. So this was one of those really thorough, on a scale of years, development cycles behind the scenes in terms of production, updates. And this does make the cut to my top seven, is the March 9th blog post talking about the state of the world of Westeros cinematic universe, is what we're calling it. After that, I, I called this like point four b This is not one of the top ten, because a couple of things happened in March, late March, which are really an extension of point one, that I said, 
once filming wrapped mid-February after the COVID delay, they said only once filming is wrapped can we think of releasing, uh, putting out this is the release date officially. That happened one month later, late March, HBO put out officially the premiere is August 21st. And they didn't just say it like in a news post here, they're like they put some effort into over social media. They did that thing through all their official channels where they put out photos of a dragon egg waiting to hatch and it said August 21st. Because up until that point, a lot of people, if you don't have a release date, people don't treat it as real. That the people are like, wow, this is really happening. They were thinking of it like the long night pilot. Oh yeah, this is some internal thing. That, no, this isn't a pilot. This is a series and has a street date now. And tying in with the announcement of the release date, they also confirmed cast members like uh, Rainier and Allison's children, though they updated their website to list that, yes, Tom Glenn Carney and uh, Ewan Mitchell and everyone else are in it, but we figured that out through spy photos that October because we had these gorgeous spy photos from Caceres of Tom Glenn Carney and Ewan Mitchell training with the Kingsguard that we knew they were playing. It was nice that they made it official. And they put out a few new promo pics that weren't anything particularly new, but late March was the aftermath of confirming, of filming wrapping, we got a confirmed release date. This is all point one. Just I'm just mentioning this chronologically, this isn't a point. Point five. Early May, the longer second teaser trailer was released and well-received. The first one was back in October, that doesn't count as this year, but... That was pretty impactful, the second teaser, because this is the first one that had real dialogue in it. It was longer, it had more shots of things, clearly, and this is the first one to try to clearly explain what the story is. I remember seeing the reactions to the first one. They thought it looked nice, but couldn't tell when it was set or what the story was. Because it was like one line, dreams didn't make us kings, dragons did. Second one, it's trying to present to a new person who hasn't read it, there's a succession crisis. Rhaenyra is up to be the heir over her uncle, but there's never been a, a ruling queen before. Simple, but for a new audience, and I think presented it well. Compared to other confusing trailers for other shows, here's what's going on. That was pretty well presented. As trailers go, that was a pretty well presented teaser. It gave more of a sense of the story, and it spurred a lot of analysis, analysis and discussion throughout May. So I know listing off, oh, we got our first trailer, is kind of simplistic for a top ten list, but on a trailer for a, as opposed to like, here's the top ten moments for 2014, we got another trailer for season four. A trailer for a new series that we don't know what it's like is pretty impactful. So the trailer was also, this isn't in my top seven moments, of course, because it's a trailer, but at the time that fueled a lot of stuff when I'm going chronologically like this. Point six is one of the big things, and actually points six through eight are interlinked. Point six is another George R. R. Martin blog post. Uh, it was the June 9th one, and he also followed up on it June 23rd, but the June 9th one was the main one. Martin blog posts talking about making substantial progress on the winds of winter. And we've come to tune that out, but on a scale of 10 years, this was the biggest update he's ever made. Where he said, I am about two-thirds done. Now, Preston Jacobs did an amazing breakdown of this. He's been following it behind the scenes more. Check out his video, and again, this video is me presenting this to Carmine and Preston anyway. They know what I'm talking about for you guys. For years, like since 2011, 2012, after Book 5 was done, Martin would say, I'm about a quarter done with The Winds of Winter. That quarter were spillover chapters he had already finished for the fifth book that got cut for time. They you know, spilled over into the sixth book. He actually made very little progress. In terms of new chapters, he wrote hardly anything from 2012 to 2020. Then the pandemic hit, and he was locked away in his mountain fortress, you know, just a cabin there, and Preston worked this out in terms of the progress Martin has said he's made. He wrote like 50% of the finished chapters, like he was a quarter done from holdover chapters to get up to two-thirds. He wrote the bulk of this in the past two years. There was amazing progress on this in 2020 and uh, 2021. 
So, and also he was even like for the first time in 10 years mentioning specific chapters that were being finished in these two linked blog posts that he said, I've actually finished all the Cersei chapters, or I'm working on a Tyrion chapter next and I'm almost done with all the Tyrion chapters. And he doesn't want to give too much away because he doesn't want to let people know, you know, if I say this person I'm still writing for, that means they're not dead yet. But whether Cersei or Tyrion survive the next book, they're probably going to have a lot of chapters in it not going to die in the first chapter, but mentioning I'm done with an entire set for one character, then I go back and do one for a different storyline, but that he very clearly explained to an extent he hadn't before, I am two-thirds done with this. Because up to this point, I think the narrative developed in a lot of people's minds that Martin's never going to finish, the TV show's the only ending, therefore it is the real ending, that, no, Winds of Winter, maybe not Book 7, but Book 6 will come relatively soon, in a few in a year or two. That he, he's inching forward, but that we have something in hand. That people thought he'd per pervasively be only a quarter done. That for him to say, I'm two-thirds done making decent progress, that I haven't hit another writer's block, that was huge news. But it wasn't one thing, it was two blog posts over the scale of a month, and Preston Jacobs reporting on it, and we tried to impress on people, I know you're tuning this out, because every couple of weeks, every you know, 2018, 2019, I'll say, oh, it's going okay, but he didn't really mean it. No, this was the most progress he's made in a decade. And real progress. That was huge news on the scale of years. That was point six out of ten, and yes, that does make the top seven list I'm eventually making, which I'll rattle off at the end. Going chronologically, again, point seven, last week of June, and again, point six, seven, and eight are linked. Last week of June, of course, was when Hibbard leaked out that there is a Jon Snow sequel spinoff in development. And we were like, yeah, right. And then Amelia Clark said, Kit told me about it. And then Martin came out and admitted, okay, not only is there a Jon Snow spinoff, we've been secretly working on it for like a year, for as long as the other three live-action spinoffs currently in development, like the Amiria and Corliss. And it was Kit Harrington's idea. He came to me, and he already has writers hired. And this thing is actually pretty far along in development. No one thought of, like, how could they have kept a lit... Not just that they would do it, but that, how did you manage to keep this secret for so long? That's what really surprised me. You never know, like, they Martin said, I never want to do a Robert's Rebellion show. If they said maybe they will, I, I go, yeah, right, maybe they're discussing it. Imagine if someone came to you today and said, we secretly filmed filmed an entire Robert's Rebellion prequel season, and no one heard a word about it. Like, how, how could you possibly keep that a secret? That's the scale of this. How did no one know you were making pitch scripts for a Jon Snow sequel thing? Of course, we haven't heard a damn thing about it since. The thing is, it's been over six months. We haven't learned anything else about it. Who's working on it? We think it's meant to be a one-shot, one-season, limited-run thing, which in turn leads me to think it's more like a Wolverine, Logan kind of epilogue that it's not going to be season nine. It's not going to be a large-scale thing. I'm guessing that from the fact it's a one-season thing. But other than that, we, we learn nothing more about what the story would be or anything. And, of course, now that Season 1 of House of the Dragon is over, all the clickbait sites need, need to constantly say, oh, well, what's the Jon Snow thing? You've run out of ideas to talk about, and there's actually quite a bit to analyze from Season 1. Or, it was weird how, remember last month, when um, everyone ran out of things to talk about, about House of the Dragon, because they didn't want to read a new book, they start, Martin went on, like, Colbert or something, and repeated, I'm about two-thirds done with the Winds of Winter. And clickbait channels started reporting on that, you know, like the screen rants of the world. And I'm like, remember when he said the exact same thing in June, six months ago, and it had a huge splash? I mean, granted, I want they weren't paying attention before House of the Dragon came out, so I guess it's news to them. Might as well repeat it. I, I shouldn't be complaining that if people weren't paying attention in June, they should repeat it now. But that was big news, but we haven't heard anything about it since. And remember when I said this is notable news, not positive or negative, that it's been very divisive. My attitude, the attitude a lot of uh, channels I've seen have, is like Quinn's ideas, is 
let Kit Harrington make fanfic to to this is ending the role on his terms, accepting it can't fix season eight or seasons five through eight, but it's a screw you to Benny Off and Weiss that this season eight was not they really thought it was the best TV season ever made. Benny Off and Weiss, when they were just in a bubble of their own ego, couldn't accept that not only was it not good, it was god awful. Even for people who put up with seasons five through seven couldn't defend it. Then insisting this is the perfect ending. And is this even the ending of the books or not? Uh, the fact that Kit Harrington of all people would not accept that was the best ending for his character is a take that at them, so I support this project. Just, I'm more interested in House of the Dragon than I am in this. This will be a fun diversion. Okay, so point... Getting back to the... This is all linked. Point six was Martin saying, I'm actually making substantial progress in the Winds of Winter. I'm up to two-thirds done. I got like half of it done in the past two years. Point seven is the leak about the Jon Snow sequel, which came out later in June. Then the week after that, July 8th, you see how they're, they're all linked, Martin made another blog post heavily, allude, not just alluding, pretty much saying that the book ending will be different from the TV show ending. And I think he handled it very well. He very politely explained, you know, just through logic, if nothing else, the outline of future books I showed Benioff and Weiss, I showed them Christmas of 2012 in the break between writing season three and four. That was ten years ago. And I'm infamously, I, I keep repeating the story that I'm the gardener type of writer who I'll change subplots very frequently. So pair this with what he said in June, that I wrote half the book in the past two years, eight years after whatever I told Benioff and Weiss, that the first week of July, Martin came out and said, well, essentially he said, even if Benioff and Weiss followed the outline he gave them in late 2012, most so much of this book has diverged in the past 10 years because I'm that kind of writer. And again, these divergences are for second and third tier things at the very least. Like, we could argue maybe Jon Snow and Daenerys' storylines are broadly similar, but like the Golden Company and Young Griff, or specific things in Marine, or the Ironborn storylines, which got completely gutted, will be very, very different. When you get down to the second tier, even like a Samuel Tarly or Brienne scale character, are probably very different. Through nothing more than story drift, that he's, I'm the type of writer, I'm a gardener, and I change subplots as I go, and it's been ten years. That his ideas have drastically changed since then. That's not even getting into, and you can't argue with this, well, maybe they followed his outline, maybe they didn't. Even if they did, he has changed since then. So you see how 6, 7, and 8 are linked. Martin saying June, Winds of Winter has been substantially finished. Then, wait, Kid Harrington wants to make a new Jon Snow ending? He doesn't think that was the perfect ending in Season 8? And then Martin coming out with a blog post outright saying, if only due to story drift, it, many things will be different in the books, even if they did what I told them to do. See, so those are all linked things, and up until then, as much as we were trying to shout on deaf ears, this couldn't be the real ending. How could Sansa have this rape subplot and then have essentially the same ending? How could this be what Daenerys actually does? It's so incoherent that even if she has, like, an Anakin Skywalker fall from grace, it wouldn't be this stupid. Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. People didn't want to listen. I wouldn't say they're fully listening now, but this is the first inklings of doubt in the mainstream audience that maybe these aren't the same ending after that trio of announcements June to July about Wins is almost done, it's actually not that much, not that similar, and new Jon Snow project. It got the gears t starting to turn, but it's going to be a while. Well, that was 6, 7, and 8. 9 and 10 are pretty straightforward, actually. I know I'm... How far am I in this? I'm not editing this. This is 24 minutes. Sorry about that. But this is a podcast. Just listen to it in the background. Um, point 9, in terms of info we got, was late... Uh, Mid-July. This is leading up to Comic-Con. We got a 
set of preseason interviews in Entertainment Weekly and THR that gave a lot of in-depth background detail. The, the, uh, in my list here, it's the preseason interviews. That the Entertainment Weekly ones are more extensive about behind the scenes on House of the Dragon, whereas the THR one, it, it was a two-parter, that for the first time, Martin explained everything that had been going on behind the scenes on the road to the first prequel since 2016. That it's a, I call it, I call it the War of the Five Pitches, and then THR copied me, that I'll, oh, it's the, fans call it the War of the Five Pitches, yeah, that's what I called it in the wiki, because I thought it was a fun name. That everything from when HBO back in 2016 first started considering pitches, to when they announced it in 2017, to when they picked Long Night in 2018, through the disaster of, it was a terrible idea to film in 2019, and that we never knew what the two out of five were. We knew the, the three that advanced to 2019 were Long Night, Dance of the Dragons, and Doom of Valyria. We ne I never knew what the other two were. And they admitted, well, one was Targaryen Conquest. That was pretty no-brainer, but it was terrible. It was this revisionist history thing. And that the fifth idea was Nymeria. That they like and want a Nymeria idea so much, they recycled it from the first wave of pitches into the second wave of pitches under a new writer. So that's one of their top ideas for a prequel. So just on the scale of this as a franchise, on a scale of years, development cycles, this was a really important article. This was a great way to go into House of the Dragon Season 1, was finally getting an in-depth article a month before saying, this is everything that went on behind the scenes for the past five years. And it even explained for the first time, we never knew Carly Rae was originally in charge of House of the Dragon. That um, Ryan Connell is the third showrunner. And the defining thing that led them to arguing with the showrunners, the old HBO, that new people came in charge and hired Connell, was they didn't want to do time skips. The controversial thing about season one is they wanted, to, they wanted Carly Rae. Carly Rae came in and HBO backed her vision of it, which is we'd start when Viserys dies. It would have been like the Princess and the Queen novella. And Martin kept arguing, you need to show the Rogue Prince novella. You need to show on a scale of 20 years how Rhaenyra and Alicent's relationship soured, how their children came to hate each other, all of that. Like, imagine if season one began with episode nine versus you need the, the time skips. And yes, season one needed to be 13 episodes. They were pushing for 13 episodes. And I still think, on the whole, they succeeded, but this is the struggle to get season one to screen. There won't be time skips again. It was, it was difficult. They had to get through it. That learning that, oh no, Carly Rae was really in charge. We never knew that before we saw that article a month before the premiere. Now, they started over from scratch, then they gave it to Brian Cogman, he left, even he said his treatment wasn't good because he was distracted by season eight, then they started over from scratch under Ryan Condal. And the stupid thing is, 2016, the first prequel idea that Martin told HBO when they said, look, the, the show's not going to run ten seasons because Benioff and Weiss said they want to leave, what should we do as a prequel? And he went to them and said, well, the top choice is do Dance of the Dragons. And they said, yeah, but is it too Game of Thronesy? And they went on this goddamned three-year-long quest to find a different prequel, wasting three years until late 2019, when they canceled Long Night and went, screw it, we'll go with Martin's idea. And it even says it in the article, this process where the people at HBO, the new people, because like Plepler left and then AT&T came in, but the other lower-level executives who were just, there's this quote where they go, Maybe we should actually listen to the living author who made this story verse when he says what the best prequel idea is. But it was a three-year process of now Martin has a lot more internal clout at HBO compared to like 2017, 2015 when they would ignore him. So in terms of our info, that was a really good article. But in retrospect, and you could combine that with one of the other points when I turn this into a top seven, but in terms of info, that I made an hour-long podcast going over that thing, because it was on the scale of five years 
franchise scale behind the scenes stuff we never knew. And point 10 of the top 10 preseason things is July 23rd, the San Diego Comic Con panel. Not for anything that happened in the panel itself, though it was a decent panel. Just the optics of we haven't had a good San Diego Comic Con panel in years. Because remember when Martin stopped coming to these after season five came out, he would not go to their Comic Con panel. That isn't, oh, well, he was busy. You don't do that. That is a sign of, I do not support this. And then Benioff and Weiss would stop coming to their own Comic-Con panels. People were surprised when they didn't come for Season 8. They didn't do that in Season 5 because they didn't want to field questions about the Sansa rape or Dorn or any of the other nonsense. They were going really off book. They came in Season 6, but they do this thing where they intentionally come when they, they have ten cast members and they just tell the moderator, don't ask me questions, I'm just sitting there. Ryan, Con Ryan Condal, in contrast, he was a lot of questions were being directed at him by the moderator. Just if you find a recording, compare this to the season six panel where they were dodging questions. Like they'd ask story questions. Like someone would ask Sophie Turner, why didn't Sansa tell John about the Vale Army? And like Benny Offelweiss are standing or sitting next to her. And she goes, I don't know, to make it dramatically satisfying. And they will not jump in to say anything. So they tuned out at Comic-Con starting 2015 onwards, and Martin wouldn't even come anymore. In contrast, we had a nice San Diego Comic-Con panel where Ryan Condal was there. The showrunner actually came. Sapachin got COVID. He couldn't come. But Ryan Condal was there. He gave substantial information about the handling questions, and... Martin came for the first time since 2014 and was giving to give the show his blessing. He might not ever never come again, I don't know, but the, the optics of that he was there with the showrunner and fielding general but nice questions about it was really, I posted clips of this. I mean, there's ten people, there's only so much each individual person could talk about. And the audience didn't really have good that many good questions because they haven't seen season one yet. It'll be interesting to see the Comic-Con post-season one where they have specific things to talk about, but th this doesn't make my cut for the top seven moments, but in, in a top ten preseason moments, the optics of we're back, Martin supports this show again, and there's a showrunner who's willing to show his face, sitting side by side with Martin giving him his blessing. That was a big moment that we needed, even if in terms of its impact, you know, we'll forget that compared to season one was really good and it's everything Martin wanted it to be. So these are the top ten moments. Uh, I left out point two, I'll get back to it. But I will quickly breeze through, I know I'm 30 minutes into this, but it's shorter, the top ten moments from season one itself that were the most notable news moments. Episode one was the top moment, it's the only one that makes the top seven, that just, it was really well made, it had good dialogue, real camera work, I keep stressing that the camera work looks normal, that there's dialogue instead of these performances, these faces, there's plot, there's politics, uh, everything about it just blew people away simply by being a well-crafted piece of television. And that alone is, is out of these ten, that's the only one that makes it to the top seven. Because it's the only one that needs to. Point two, related to point one, the revelation that the Targaryen kings knew about the return of the White Walkers, which in turn further stresses that season eight couldn't be the real ending. And it's so weird when you still run into people who go, why are they stressing this prophecy so much when we know nothing comes of it in season eight? I'm just gaping at them. I wish I could do this live. It's just over Twitter and stuff. We took that as implying Season 8 wasn't the real ending, rather than why are they doubling down on the Jon Snow, Prince That Was Promised thing when it doesn't matter. This show is saying it did matter, that wasn't the real ending. In terms of impact, this is a bit um, on the fence, because we had heard leaks about this a year ahead of time. And Martin himself... I, I made videos showing Martin was talking about this during uh, when Fire and Blood came out in 2018. Made a big splash at the time, but we all kind of forgot that uh, he was implying, you know, Aegon the Conqueror 
might have known about the White Walkers. And then to tie in again that, yeah, this is from the books. This is a thing. They secretly knew about it. And in the top, in the top seven list, I've combined these as one thing, by the way, that uh, episode one... Here I'm putting it as two things. The impact of a well-crafted episode and point two... It, Reinforce no the prophecy stuff does matter in the top in the top seven list that's one big thing is it was one event and I'm telling you just the impact of the first episode the like channels who said I am going to hate watch this and give up on it like the one that really sticks in my mind is Angry Joe that it really discouraged me that I thought people were coming around in the show as late as July and then I saw him that people are so betrayed by season eight they were traumatized to the point they wouldn't even look up that, no, this is made by an entirely different set of creative staff. There's different writers. Different people are in charge at HBO. Like, the Plepler administration is gone. That Everything we saw about the filming of this that I was reporting on for two years was encouraging. They weren't following the news because they didn't want to because it was so traumatizing. Or, like, Quinn's Ideas also said, I'm not going to follow... I'm going to hate watch the first episode. And then both of those channels, Quinn's Ideas and Angry Joe, put out these things after episode one going, I was wrong! This show is really good! And then it was so encouraging to see, like, Angry Joe made episode reviews of the entire season, all ten episodes. That just how much the impact of episode one changed minds in the mainstream audience. You know, most of these top seven points are for the hardcore A Song of Ice and Fire fandom, or even the hardcore TV fandom for the fandom, for general audiences who are TV viewers but not were hanging on every behind-the-scenes report, they were not prepared for how good episode one was. I wasn't that prepared, and I'd been following it. It was just because I hadn't seen it in motion of, is the cinematography good? Is it well put together? Everything else, they you could not compare that experience. Point three out of the top ten for season one is that right after episode one came out, within days, they renewed it for season two, and as soon as they got season two renewal, Sapochnik said he was leaving. But that wasn't a big shake-up. He said, I always intended to leave after the first season. I just wanted to get it on its legs. And I wasn't that surprised either, because I got the feeling that they just you know, really gave him the dump truck of money. To A lot of people said they wouldn't have watched this show up until they hired him. When they said, no, no, we hired Sapochnik and gave him co-showrunner status so a crazy writer can't overrule him when all, all the production problems on season 8 and season 6, when Benioff and Weiss told him to do physically impossible things, he only came back for not just the dump truck of money, but we'll make you a co-showrunner so no one can overrule you. And a lot of people, he still had the respect, they even said we hired him because the fans still respect him, even if they don't respect Benioff and Weiss. A lot of people wouldn't have watched if he hadn't come back. Still, I think we need some turnover to try new hands at this. And you know, I respect a lot of the work he did, but that wasn't really giant news, because I got the feeling he wasn't going to stay for more than one season. And then they, indeed, Condal confirmed he never planned on staying beyond the first season, because it's a lot of work. It's exhausting. He said he wants to go on break. He might even come back in a later season. I'm not sure. But, okay, that was point three, that renewal, but Sapochnik isn't coming back, and he didn't intend to come back. And like I said, other than points one and two is one combined point, <coughs> none of this comes back to the top seven I made at the end. Uh, point four is just Matt Smith was well-received as Damon. <laughs> that a lot of people, when he was cast, there was this whole controversy, if he can't be Damon, and like, I've seen, I look for, I posted clips of things where he plays like gangsters and stuff, he can play a villain. Particularly the American fandom, who are just so used to him as Doctor Who, and it's like, you do realize he's an actor, and he's played villainous roles in things you haven't seen. I did not think he would be this good. I thought he'd be good. I didn't think he'd be this great as just he is Daemon. The rogue prince and his flippancy, and just he is amazing. But for people who were actively on the fence about <laughs> he can't play the rogue prince Daemon, that within three episodes, people were sold on him. I'm going roughly chronologically here, that by episode three-ish, particularly with the battle thing, and just his flippancy, and just his overall performance, people really came around to loving Damon by, and Matt Smith as Damon by the third episode. That was point four. Point five out of the top ten is 
And this isn't a best moments of season 10, it's top moments, good or bad, that we were talking about as a news thing. Not just I liked it, but it fueled discussion. Point five is, there was a lot of discussion about episode four, how they handled the sex scenes. This is listed as, female director actually handles a female gay sex scene well. Because this was a, a major criticism of Game of Thrones, is you got these two frat boys in charge who have no idea how to film an erotic sex scene. It's, it just looks, it's like a 13 year old boy uh, obsessing over a porno mag or something, that this is gratuitous and there's no artistry to it. And just all the complaints about this isn't, this is offensive to women, that it's objectifying, all the stuff we said about late Game of Thrones and even early Game of Thrones. This was the first time they actually they had a did it right. They put a female director in charge, and she talks about in the inside the episode, not just some obscure interview. I was trying to handle female gaze, like you see things from. It's not just showing off the nudity very prominently, but like there's obscure shots where it's, you're only seeing from Rhaenyra's perspective. She's walking through a dark hallway, so you see glimpses of things really fast, or focusing on hands as they're touching her. That They explain this, of just how do you do a female gaze thing. And I, I put this so high because it was a specific criticism of Game of Thrones that they directly addressed, and which lots of people, not just me, are writing articles about how well they did it. Like Federica... Bacho over on winteriscoming.net, and I've seen uh, other videos and articles in mainstream things going, wow, the cinematography was really well done in this. And even if it wasn't a gratuitous sex scene, it's this is how to do this the right way, was something we were discussing. As opposed to people just going, ew, she's kissing her uncle, that wasn't... Guys, you've been watching this show for eight years, you know what the Targaryens are like, that in terms of the filmmaking. But that's point five out of 10 most notable things, newsworthy things that we were talking about from season one. Number six is from episode six, the 10 year time skip. Like it or not, in terms of things we were talking about, that you had to shift the lead actors on this. That was huge. That was the defining controversy of this show. That, as I said in the other list, that's one of the reasons HBO was initially hesitant for it, that the initial version under Carly Rae starts with the war, starts when Viserys dies. And it was a year, three years long argument that they had to fight to get Condal in charge saying, I do want to do a 10 year time skip. You need to show how Rainier and Allison's relationship changes over time because they're the faction leaders on both sides. Generally, I think they did this well. And I don't blame HBO for saying, being hesitant. As Casey Bloys later said, it wasn't that we thought it would be confusing it's because it is difficult to cast one lead actor. It's a global search to find Maisie Williams as Arya or Amelia Clark as Daenerys. Now you're asking us to do that twice for the same character and have them match at different ages. That is a Herculean task. I don't blame their hesitance. That Consider what a triumph it was that they not only got Emma Darcy, but subsequently did a global search for someone who can convincingly play a younger version of Emma and found Millie Alcock. And it's just amazing how well they matched this. And then repeated the process with Allison. That they took Olivia Cook and then found Emily Carey. That is amazing. And it was it was very difficult. And we forget because they succeeded that they make it look easy. It was really hard. I don't blame them for that. In terms of the story structure, we're still, again, this is good or bad, whether we're debating this. Martin himself said they needed 13 episodes, and yes, they needed one between episodes 5 and 6 to smooth over the aftermath of the wedding that Kristen Cole is still in the King's Garden stuff. But in terms of that the actors matched very well and the story kept going, I think people generally stuck with it. There's always some casual ones I've seen quitting it, but general... TV reaction channels on YouTube, not Game of Thrones channels, but general ones said, I like how they put it, it's a little jarring, but we got used to it within two episodes, and it was fine because the characterization and writing was still good, and we came to like the new actors who were actually the original. They cast the adults first, then the kids based on them. Thankfully, there's no new time skips next season. And that was the only 
big time skip, the 10 year one, not the smaller ones. They go between their kids to teenagers in episode eight or episode three. The 10 year time skip was big, but not a game breaker. I like how Preston Jacobs put it in one of his things. He said, a big time skip where you have to shift actors is like having a tumor. That uh, It's like going, I successfully went through chemotherapy. It's not some... You never really want to say, I successfully went through chemotherapy. You don't want a tumor in the first place. It's like saying, my broken leg successfully healed. Good, I guess. But you know, it's a challenge that you rise to, not a good thing that just happens. So, I, I generally think, given the difficulty of the task they managed to do it, everyone wishes there were more episodes this season. I really hope they make a TV movie at some point to bridge the gap. Like Andor. That would be fun. And you could do it like five years from now, just for fun. We'll see what happens. And still, in terms of things we were talking about, was the time skip was number six. Number seven is how divisive episode seven was. That a lot of people just go, oh, so many... I'm, I, this grand scheme of things, I'm happy they liked it. I didn't want people to hate this season. But general viewers were so in love with the Rhaenyra Allison confrontation, which was amazing, that they didn't pay attention to some of the other stuff, like the lighting problems in the first half, which is a one shot problem. Or as a book fan, I was hesitant about the lane or changes. I came around to, okay, they're playing around with the unreliable narrator that he survives. That's not really the problem. The problem is that Sea Smoke, his dragon, will need to bond with someone else next season. That's really a season two problem, so I've tabled the problem. Just, okay, I'm not mad about it, but you need to address Sea Smoke next season. We'll deal with that. In terms, of, This is something that was fueling discussion, was number seven is the Sea Smoke stuff. And I hate how Benioff and Weiss would go, oh no, we didn't forget, like, Martin would be pointing out the butterfly effect if you change something... It needs to. You need to account for how it'll happen later, and they were they were just yessing us. Oh no no we, no! We're paying attention when we kill off that character. No, they weren't. Versus this, these writers are generally on the ball. If they didn't want to kill off Lainor, fine. But I, I've said this already. Give a throwaway line about how Sea Smoke could bond with someone else, and I will be fine as long as you la hang a lampshade on it, as they say. Address it. I'll go along with it. But this was thankfully followed by the best episode of the season, episode 8, so point eight out of 10 is Patty Considine's Emmy-level performance in episode 8. That's the point. Even though it was just us raving about how good it was, high point of the season, the two-for-one here, the throne room scene, all of it through He Can Keep His Tongue, and the dinner scene, just all of it was amazing. I know this isn't really a news or discussion point, but it blew everyone away. and was like, how is this guy not getting nominations for things at the January Awards, which are different from the Emmys. The Emmys are in September. We'll see what happens. That was point eight. Point nine of the top ten news things we were discussing in season one was the Rainey's escape in episode nine was a bit sloppy and needed more setup scenes. At the time, it was a huge controversy. I think episode 10 blunted that, thankfully, because they gave a clear explanation, an explanation, right at the beginning. Why didn't you kill them? Well, am I on your side or not? I don't know. Because last episode 8, I was willing to, on the verge of testifying against your sons, am I on your side, Rhaenyra? They wanted to give Ra Rhaenys more to do. They wanted to give her a character arc where she comes around to being on Rhaenyra's side. And I've already said this, that I think that falls under the time skip issues, that they needed 13 episodes. That you needed more time to set up her doubt about whether she would kill them or not. It, with a few more scenes. So I, I throw that in with, because I'm trying to consolidate, things were rushed. I said my two complaints about the whole season, I only had two, I made a video about this, were they needed 13 episodes, and the constant fear of how do you write gray characters. So for this one, it's weird. I, I checked with general TV review YouTube channels. Most were generally going, see, they gave an explanation right at the beginning of episode 10, and they were fine with it. For me, I will say, it was probably the weakest point of the season, but it wasn't a game-breaker. 
that it's this was a little rushed and a little sloppy as opposed to totally nonsensical. I, I get what you're trying to do, that she said, I'm not sure if I'm on your side, but you needed to set it up better. And it's so I keep wondering, if they had aired episodes 9 and 10 back-to-back, -back, would we have even had that controversy? That this isn't something on the scale of the Sansa controversy or uh, the TV Jordan in season 5, it's just it was a little sloppy that... Those two episodes are two halves, 9 and 10. First, what the Greens are doing, what the Blacks are doing. Should have aired them back to back. I don't think we would have seen that level of vitriol that we did in the week intervening there, that as soon as I saw they gave an explanation, fine. It's a little sloppy. I think we can move forward, and I don't even consider this one of the top 10 news points of the year, because they gave an explanation, it was a flare-up at the time, let's move on. It really didn't ruin... Other things in Season 1 I was more worried about, retroactively, once they explained it. Not the best explanation, but an explanation. And point 10, like I said, was the two things were fine-tuning gray characters. Episode 10 is actually a twofer. It's Daemon and Amond. That they changed Amond so he's not a pure villain, but he was just screwing with Luke and then lost control of his... The, the, if you're screwing with these giant predator animals, they'll eventually just freak out and attack each other. That he wasn't really trying to kill Luke, and now he's just, uh-oh. I think that kind of works. I've seen comparisons with... Uh, that we can tell he's going to come back and rather than look like an idiot, claim he did it on purpose, rather than admit it was an accident. That it's better to be seen as ruthless than incompetent. So I've seen comparisons of that with Jamie Lannister, that... Jamie never really wanted to tell people why he really killed the Mad King out of pride, and they wouldn't believe me anyway, and that I really killed him to save everyone, that I'll keep it to myself, why bother? The, I, I think it's, it's playing around with the unreliable narrator thing, that the, the source we have is an in-universe history book that would never know what really happened, because Amon was the only witness. That works pretty well. They, you want him to be gray. He can't be a mustache-twirling villain. He started out as the kid we saw in episodes 5 and 6. The Daemon stuff, people were annoyed about when he half-chokes Rhaenyra. You can't really choke someone one-handed, but it's still, he, he's hurting her. Um, I get what they were trying to do, I've already talked about this, that they wanted to show this is an out-of-character moment. He is totally freaking out at the revelation that Viserys never told him the prophecy, never really considered him an heir. That this is what TV Tropes calls an out-of-character, serious business moment. And again, not a controversy on the scale of Sansa Rape or TV Dorn, just... Well, they actually explained this at the convention. They said, uh, Condal said, Some international venues put ads in the shows, and normally it doesn't affect how long an episode can run. Some of the mid-season episodes are very long, but for the finale, HBO put their foot down and said ratings are going to be high for a finale. It can't be any longer than this certain time limit, so we can put ads in. And Condal was really annoyed, because he said, we already made it longer than that, and you should have told me earlier, so we could have planned around this. Which is why they carefully went through and trimmed it down to just the plot-relevant scenes, the plot mechanics moving the story forward, rather than character-building scenes. Case in point, he revealed, there's this scene between Bela and Rhaenys, which I hope they rework into the beginning of Season 2, in some fashion, that similarly... And Red Team Reviews pointed this out. There, you can tell from trailers and spy photos that there were more scenes of Daemon in private freaking out on the beach that my whole life was alive. His heir, my brother never trusted me to be his heir. And you see how much this affected him. And they trimmed it for time. The result of which is you don't really present as well that Daemon is losing it. This is not normal for him, even for him, that he is freaking out at this. I do want, I don't want them to whitewash Damon. I want them to show this is like a Sid and Nancy kind of slap, slap, kiss, kiss kind of relationship, not unlike Jamie Cersei, that they are not this epic romance, but that they're, they're these firecracker characters playing off each other. I think, I get what they were trying to do. I don't blame them for doing it, but at the same time, I would not have done it the same way. And maybe it would have played better if those trim scenes of showing how affected Daemon is would have given it more context. 
But again, out of this top 10 list, the only one I would actually think rises to news of the year level is that episode one was really good. The Rainies thing, the Dame, I think that doesn't rise to top things this season for me at all. Not even the top five. That in terms of the year scale, the big thing was episode one was really well done. And reviewers who had given up on the show, I mean, thing like Angry Joe and Quinn's idea said, we're going to hate watch the first episode to say it's bad. And then it blew them away and they finished the whole season with glowing reviews for every episode that they did not, they were so burned by season eight, they weren't even going to research that, no, there's different people in charge now. No one thought it would be that good. And point two out of ten for things of season one is also from episode one that, uh, the White Walker prophecy was actually important, and they put it back in. So from this top ten of season one list, I'm combining points one and two into one point for the top seven of the year list. I say I'm going to take the top ten preseason things, which are franchise scale things, and the top ten from season one itself, which are just bonus for me. That's not why I made this video. I'm going to take these two top ten lists of 20 things and condense it down to seven because the top 10 season one things are really just episode one was good and, ha and restressed the prophecy stuff. That's all one point. And that is the top point, point one of seven of the top seven news points of the year. Now I have to go back to the top 10 preseason things and condense that down to six things to make a top seven, because seven is a good number. And really, some of those things weren't that big, like when they showed us the new writers. That That isn't that big in there. So now here we are, what is this, 50 minutes into this? <sighs> Finally showing my work, getting down to, I know, summarizing a full year of news, guys, in this podcast, of the top seven things that the top one was, episode one was good and had a prophecy reveal, what are the other six? Well, point two would be the Jon Snow sequel spinoff leak, for good or ill in terms of got people talking and how shocking it was. That was number two. Point three, I'm condensing some of the blog posts. To get, point three is Martin's blog posts in June and July about the Winds of Winter, collectively. Because they were in week within weeks of each other, across about one month, from June 9th through July 9th, saying, I am two-thirds done in the past two years, I did more work than I've done in the past ten, and I went from being a quarter done to two-thirds done. I'm done with specific characters like Cersei and Tyrion. And then at the end of this set of blog posts saying, you do realize that simply due to time passing, I'm a Gardner-style writer, Winds of Winter will be di very different for many of the second and third tier characters, at the very least. Even if they did follow the outline I gave them in 2012, I've changed a lot since then. That's just how I write. Point four out of seven is the filming delay due to COVID, which pushed the premiere date back that affected our news reporting for the entire year. Now, you will remember that at the beginning of this, I said there's a top ten preseason things and number two, I'm going to skip for now because it's something that happened in February that would take a while to explain. That survives as point five. Point five, and point two out of ten for preseason things, which is so big it survives as point five out of seven in the combined list. Super Bowl Sunday in February. The first teaser trailer for Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power was one of the top seven news items for a Song of Ice and Fire Game of Thrones fandom across the scale of the entire year. Bigger than most things from within Season 1 itself, the later episodes, and this was one of the top seven moments. Why is that? Well, think back, to really pause and think back to where we were last January. Going into 2022, when people were making 2022 prediction videos and major news sites and everything, 2022 was supposed to be the year of Lord of the Rings. This was supposed to be the year of Rings of Power. 
It was the best show ever when we didn't know anything about it. Like House of the Dragon was pretty open about they weren't punishing people for posting leaks because they knew they needed hype to rebuild the franchise. There were no leaks. Up till that first teaser, we knew almost nothing about this show, who anyone was playing. And it was like that thought-terminating cliche thing when it's just catchphrases. You just hear short sound bites and catchphrases. Well, of course Lord of the Rings is going to be the best show of the year. It's the most expensive TV production in history. That catchphrase over and over, it's so expensive. Well, how does that guarantee it's good? Like, it reminded me of Season 8, going into Season 8, that it was the biggest budgeted season ever. And how do you know it's good? They have no idea what they're doing. I just kept saying early, like in January, let's wait for confirmation. I know nothing about the story that they're trying to tell. They're not adapting a book that Tolkien wrote very little about the Second Age, and I don't blame them for that, that comparing it to House of the Dragon, they had a more difficult adaptation to do. They just had to make up a lot of story elements, for good or bad. Not a lot of source material. That I hate how the hype media, it's not one person directing it, would that it were, the groupthink and echo chamber that news reporting has turned into, that it just became a meme almost, that this will be the year of Lord of the Rings, when we knew nothing about it. There were no photos. We had no idea what story they were telling other than it's the Second Age. Nothing. And there was blind faith that it would be the show of the year. January 2022, it was supposed to be the show of the year, and House of the Dragon was being dismissed as, oh yeah, that they're trying to make another Game of Thrones thing. I'm going to hate watch the first episode, maybe, and then give up on it. That is where we were 12 months ago, last January. And when the teaser trailer for, the first teaser trailer for Lord of the Rings came out at the Super Bowl, it, it was in one night, in one five-minute burst, it's like a switch went off that it was a terrible teaser trailer, and no one had anticipated that. They weren't even waiting for it with anticipation to see if it was good or not. They assumed it would be good. I just remember all the, the Zoom conferences that major, new, major fan sites were holding for. They had panels ready to dissect it. It was one minute long, there was nothing to dissect, and they were slack-jawed. I remember the look on their faces. These are people I respect and still do. Just, I was surprised. I had the same expression. And I must say and stress that that was a bad teaser even relative to the show that ultimately came out. But when I actually saw Rings of Power, it wasn't as bad as that trailer made it look at all. Even later full trailers for it that came out in the summer looked decent, or at least better than that teaser. That was an awful teaser. It made it look like this weird 80s fantasy thing, which wasn't but that led to massive backlash. And I was actually, at that point, I oddly switched into being the minority of going, well, the teaser was terrible, but then I, and I, I've explained this, I went and they gave their first interviews ever, the showrunners with Vanity Fair and a trio of interviews, and I went, oh, on paper, your ideas for this show aren't that crazy. And that was my reaction to season one in a nutshell, that it's just, Many of these were good ideas on paper. They were just poorly executed. Please do better in season two. That I actually had a nuance. It wasn't a dumpster fire or a show. It was a very flawed show. But there were core things that, like, well, that wasn't inherently bad. It's just you didn't do it well. Okay, like, I thought I'd hate the Harfoot storyline. And it was actually presentable. It wasn't a billion-dollar budget worth of good quality. But it would, I, I got invested in it. I mean, like, it's more like $700 million if you take out the ad money uh, for the advertising campaign. R roughly, Lord of the Rings cost three times as much to make as House of the Dragon. And it was not three times the quality. It was maybe 90% of the quality of House of the Dragon. And even then, I'm being generous because it is targeted at a younger audience. It is meant, it's the difference between a PG-13 movie and an R-rated movie. Like, the ad, for, the ad campaign for Lord of the Rings showed kids watching it. It was meant to be viewed by children. The same cannot be said of House of the Dragon. So it's unfair to compare their writing quality in a certain... Like they're not shooting that high. But, in terms of presentation and everything, just... It, it could have been better, and it wasn't worth the three times the budget they put in. So, when I say 
the top seven news events, I'm using the Super Bowl Sunday first teaser trailer of Lord of the Rings as a catch-all moment encapsulating what was a running theme throughout the rest of 2022 as every new trailer came out. Now, the later trailers for Lord of the Rings were actually better, but it's the, the, the blind hype in January, because this show had been in development for four years, it's like the mystery box, like the Christmas present that you don't know what's in it, therefore it's got to be amazing when you haven't opened it yet. That the blind faith that all of that, and they'd seen one teaser for House of the Dragon, which actually looked pretty decent for something with no dialogue in it. It was a short teaser. But then every time a new trailer came out for Lord of the Rings and a new one for House of the Dragon, there were increasingly, it was this process throughout the spring and summer that like particularly my, on my list of the top 10 moments, one of the other ones was the second teaser that actually presented the story of House of the Dragon, which came out in May. People were starting to look at that and going, this looks better than the trailers for the Lord of the Rings. Even though like the second Lord of the Rings teasers with Galadriel and stuff and real dialogue looked better by the summer, they didn't look as good as House of the Dragon. So it was that fate or... Providence that, that not only... What would it have been like if the first Lord of the Rings teaser was a reasonable presentation of the quality level that we actually got? Because people were expecting an 11 out of 10. The actual show, I will generously say, was a 7 out of 10. And the teaser made it look like a 3 out of 10. So within one night, people expecting an 11 out of 10 thought this show looks like a 3 out of 10, and were horrified and stunned, genuinely stunned. So that actually led people talking about Lord of the Rings versus House of the Dragon, the Super Bowl teaser. That is why I do include it in this list of news for us, because it really, on a meta level, macro level, shifted how the news was treating these two competing franchises that... Remember in the summer they kept hyping up it's going to be the Battle of the Fantasy Titans between the Lord of the Rings and House of the Dragon once they had seen more trailers for it. Last January, they would not have framed this as the Battle of the Fantasy Titans. They didn't see it as a competition. They thought Lord of the Rings was going to be this movie-quality eight-episode show that would curb-stomp what was already going to be a failure on its own terms much less competing, that the Cows of the Dragon is going to be as bad as Season 8 was. Lord of the Rings show will be amazing simply because it's expensive. There was no talk of a Battle of the Fantasy Titans before that Super Bowl teaser. Then that started shifting the narrative. People started wondering. Then uh, three months later, another House of the Dragon longer trailer comes out that by the summer, they were starting to phrase this as the Battle of the Fantasy Titans. And then I wouldn't say House of the Dragon curb stomped Lord of the Rings, but it clearly won on its own relative to what it set for itself. Lord of the Rings didn't achieve its own goals. I wouldn't say it was terrible. Like, if their goal was a 10, they did like a 7. And I'm rarely am I, I this on the fence about a show where I'm like, do better in season 2, but I'm not willing to totally give up on you. So some, some of the core ideas here weren't too crazy. They were very poorly executed. Like, anything with the Halbrand storyline was god-awful. The other parts, I was surprised, you know, this is surprisingly good, like Arondir and the Southlands, or the Harfoots, or the Dwarves even, were enjoyable. And I think they meant this to be a binge-release show, not weekly episodic, as they commissioned it four years ago, when they were still doing Dump Everything at Once, like The Boys Season 1 was dumped on a single day in the old Netflix binge model. Then Season 2 of The Boys shifted to episodic. That I think Lord of the Rings was so slow because they wanted it to be binged, not episodic, and they could adjust that for Season 2. I wish they'd just admit that. Well, when we thought, we thought it was a long movie, not episodic. Fine. But the I thought I'd hate the invented characters. The worst part was when they took established characters from the Galadriel storyline of Numenor and condensed it very badly. But they were surprisingly capable of making decent plot lines invented from thin air, like the Harfoot stuff. But I encapsulate that entire year-long experience of the comparison with Lord of the Rings as what really started that shift. And it was a really hard shift the night of Super Bowl Sunday. 
when people saw this isn't the perfect Lord of the Rings show. No one trailer for House of the Dragon had that much impact because people still needed to warm up to it. I mean, they go, well, that was a good trailer, but does that reflect how good the show will be? I have trepidation about this. But every trailer that came out looked better and better, and people gradually warmed up to it. Is it, is it easier to lose reputation than it is to slowly build reputation? I don't know. So, in my chronological list of the top ten preseason moments, that was chronologically number two. And yes, in terms of impact, more than a lot of things in season one, the Super Bowl teaser for Lord of the Rings is a catch-all for, as the year progressed, the trailers looked really good for one and not the other, and the news, their predefined narrative that this is the year of Lord of the Rings shifted into the year of the Battle of the Fantasy Titans, then after Fall shifted into this was the year of House of the Dragon. That is point five out of seven on my list here of the top seven things. And wrapping up, uh, point six is the March 9th blog post confirming for the first time on a scale of five years, these are all of the other spin-offs that are in development since House of the Dragon got greenlit. The Phase 2 spin-offs since early 2021, these are the new things we've been working on behind the scenes. So let me, I know I spent a long time explaining that, so run through here. Number one was, episode one was really good and had the prophecy as one big thing. Number two, Jon Snow sequel spinoff leak. Number three, the combined, the combined blog posts across June and July in which Martin said, I am really two-thirds done with Winds of Winter, I got half done, and it'll probably be very different simply because I wrote it ten years later. Point four is the COVID delay, which pushed the premiere back. Point five is encapsulating the Rings of Power rivalry that think back where we were last January, that the Super Bowl teaser in, in February for Lord of the Rings looked really bad, and then people started second-guessing maybe House of the Dragon is actually going to really compete with this thing. And then as every new trailer came out, it did. Point six is the blog post confirming on a scale of years all the spin-offs. And point seven is just linked to point six, the big interviews that they gave in EW and THR right before, you might as well lump this in with San Diego Comic-Con, all the discussion about these are the road to the first prequel, these are other things we were working on, we actually wanted to get a Nymeria show in the first wave of prequels, but here it is now. So I'm going to write this out as text in the description box below. Like I said, I rambled this off as an audio-only podcast. Of I came up with the top seven things of the year. I'm interested if you make different lists and will make the distinction I did between episode season one as a whole didn't have one big controversial thing on the scale of we might be making a Nymeria show or we killed Stannis. There was nothing really terrible in, 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 on that. There were complaints in season one here or there, but the wow of that first episode is if I had to make a list of seven things, that is the only thing I'd put from the actual season in it. And the other six things were things about Winds of Winter, Jon Snow sequel, other spinoffs, or the general news rivalry between it and Rings of Power and how it changed over time. So... It's weird how I don't do live streams, and I feel guilty when I make a long video like this. But I guess I'll set this to a li uh, to be a live premiere, so people get the idea that this isn't meant to be a short. This is a, me rambling in an audio, because like other channels, like David Lightbringer will post a three-hour thing, and no one complains because well, it's a live stream. I I, I just don't do live streams. It's scheduling wise, I, it's impossible. For me. I'm always jumping in and out of here, so. You could have read this in the description box if I said these are, I came up with a list of the top news moments, and you can listen to this hour-long podcast as my rationalization of why were these the top moments, and I hope you agree. If not, I'm more interested in what Red Team Review and Preston Jacobs have to say in their assessment of the top news moments, and again, it's positive or negative. It's simply the biggest moments that we were talking about, most notable news events from the past calendar year. 
I wasn't planning on making this. Now I'm making a looking ahead to 2023 video scheduling wise. What are we going to do during this gap year? Because season two isn't coming back until July of 2024. Just looking at a schedule. They said, don't expect it calendar year 2023. What else is on TV that we're going to be watching? Like, I have an HBO Max account now. I might as well watch The Last of Us because it's got Game of Thrones veterans Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey in it, and I like zombie movies. Uh, but other projects are going to be working on when my Blu-ray stuff come out with the real Blu-ray that has the cartoons in it. Other scheduling stuff we're going to do. So I made this as bonus content. I'm setting it to live premiere. I'm more concerned with what you guys think in the comments. I'm going to try to respond to everyone of what would you list as the top news moments of the year, good or bad.